Thank you for having me, Mr. Burstein. It's my pleasure. Mwah. Mwah. Okay, we're moving a little fast. I, apo down. I apologize. Sit down. Let's start with the basics. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, where to begin? Let's see. I was born in 1517 in Milan, Italy. My full name is Michelangelo Marisi de Caravaggio, but I'm also known by many, many other names. I was named after the Caravaggio province in Bergamo, Italy. It's a little area near the place that I was born. And you moved there to avoid the plague in Milan later in your life, correct? Hold it up. Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> Now I have in my notes a man by the name of Simone Pietrozano. Tell us a little bit about that man. Ah, uh, Simone. What a guy. He mentored me in the profession of painting. We could talk about art under the Milan sun all day if we wanted to. Such an amazing teacher. After this apprenticeship, Caravaggio moved to Rome sometime between 1588 and 1592. My first commission was assigned to me back in 1600 by Cardinal Del Monte. He asked me to paint the calling of St. Matthew, the martyrdom of St. Matthew, and St. Matthew writing his gospel. Obviously all religious paintings. How did you find yourself handling this newfound success? Well, I'd say I handled this new success wonderfully. Let's talk about something different. Well, maybe I didn't handle it so well. I was jailed several times and did have a death warrant from the Pope. But that's just cause in 1606 I killed a man over a wager in a tennis match. No big deal. Over the next few years, Caravaggio was involved in several more fights, leaving him severely injured. Despite this, he continued to pursue his love of painting. In 1610, he died at age 38 while returning to Rome in the hopes of receiving a pardon. Wait, what? Some say he died of malarial fever, though nothing is confirmed. I personally like assassination best. I'm not so sure I'm comfortable with this whole thing. Do we have a clip? Okay, roll clip. What a wonderful, lovely scene to sketch. I can't wait to return to painting's beauty. Wow, I just don't know what to say to that. Let's discuss your legacy as an artist. Some say that your work was not original, that you copied it, sometimes poorly from others. Poppycock and horse feathers. If anything, I was the one that was plagiarized from. Yet, humorously, despite your best efforts to protect your unique style, you managed to become one of the most imitated artists in history. You also often spoke badly about other painters, acting as if you knew something the others didn't. You acted as if you had made a great discovery. Which I had? Yes. Your use of contrasting light and dark figures, creating a dramatic mood, almost like a stage play. You applied lifelike realism, realism to your projects. Other artists were not a fan of this radical new style. That's correct. They didn't like me so much. I wasn't a fan of his work. Some accused you of simply painting what your audience wanted, rather than painting beauty. Balderdash. They were merely jealous. I am a realist and I painted as such. I didn't do it the classical way with sketches and drawings. I went straight to the canvas for my work. Because of this, there was a sense of imperfection in your pictures, in people, in human bodies. This infuriated both critics at the time and people. A true artiste paints with a realistic eye. He doesn't have dull, perfect bodies marching around on his canvas. There are also many that say that you are homosexual, or at least bisexual. In some of your work, portraits of men and boys look more feminine. That, my friend, is a load of hooey. There are also those that say that the reason most of your paintings involve death and sexuality is because of all the murders and assaults you were involved in. Well, that one... That one may just be true. Some of your critics say that you used an optic device to, or spotlight while painting. 
It would have projected the figure that you were attempting to paint onto your canvas. They justify this accusation by noting that no drawings were ever found. There are also those that say that you put your painting together by painting through vivid and little projections from a mirror. Your painting would have looked like a collage if this were the process, which they do. They call this technique a camera obscura. Bunkum, I say. My work wasn't classical renaissance work. I did it my way. I was a master of my talent and I broke the renaissance rules when I felt like it. You had quite a serious rivalry with a Mr. Giovanni Baglione, isn't that right? Yes. He was an Italian painter and an art historian. That plagiarist ripped off my painting Amor Vincit Omnia and then sued me for libel. He claimed that I was jealous of his work. Ha! Me jealous of him? Ridiculous. As I said back in the trial, I don't know any painter who thinks Giovanni Baglione is a good painter. I was found guilty for this nonsensical charge and thrown in prison for two weeks. Can we talk about this painting? Why not talk about this painting? I love it. I showed Cupid in such a different way. Instead of showing him as some innocent little boy prancing around and smiling, I showed him in an imperfect, realistic eye. I believe this is one of the paintings that caused critics to believe that you are a homosexual? That is most certainly horse dribble. I guess we can go back to talking about my misguided critics. Um, <clears throat> yes. A painter and biographer by the name of Giovanni Bellori was said to be one of your detractors. Yes, he was one of those ninnies that valued idealism over realism. I couldn't stand him. But come on, you haven't even brought up Vincenzo Carducci yet. How have you waited so long? Alright, tell us about Vincenzo Carducci. He was another Italian painter. He stated, and I quote, This anti-Michelangelo with his showy and external copying of nature, his admirable technique and liveliness has been able to persuade such a large number of all kinds of people that his is good painting and that this that his theory and practice are right, and they have turned their backs on the true manner of perpetuating themselves and on true knowledge in this matter of art. He sounds nice. Tell us about Giulio Mancini. He was a noted physician, art collector, and writer. He was also a discerning art collector. It is his opinions and writings about artists like you that we study today when we learn of such a creative soul. Lastly, let's discuss Peter Robb. He published a biography of you in 1988 called M. The book was the source of controversy when it was published in Britain in 2000. Well, I haven't read it, but if the book is about me, it must be good. How about we take a look at some more of your work? Here's a picture of the card sharps. It's a painting you made in 1595. You give a certain amount of dignity to even the lowest of criminals in your painting, you delicately let the audience in on the deception of the two conars without showing it to their face without forcing it into their faces. Now, let's discuss two paintings you mentioned earlier, Calling of St. Matthew and the Martyrdom of St. Matthew. I completed the painting Calling in 1599, closer to 1600, for the Contarelle Chapel in the Church of the French Congregation in Rome. Both paintings hang together along with the inspiration of St. Matthew. Calling depicts the story of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is showing up at Matthew's house and leading him away. He's bringing light to a truly dark room. A simple daily routine is being interrupted by a miracle. Martyrdom caused me difficulty, however. I never painted so large a canvas with so many people. You can spot many references from other artists. Inspiration was another difficult project for me. Matthew is hard at work while an angel bothers him from the heavens. Fascinating. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Caravaggio. And thank you so much for inviting me, Mr. Burstein. It was my pleasure. Great. Now get out of my house.